Welcome to the uh, Physics Paper 2 revision video. Uh, so these are the topics that come up in Paper 2. We've got forces, waves, um, magnetism and electromagnetism. Now what I'm going to try and do for you is just to break, out, break up this topic into the, into the main areas that you need to be revising. Um, I definitely recommend still using the revision guide to go into detail into these topics. This is really just the headline ideas from, this, uh, from these topics which will start as a foundation for your revision as you move into, into more uh, detailed revision for your real exams. Okay, so we're going to start off with forces then. Um, so forces can be either contact forces or non-contact forces. Really that just means touching or not touching forces. So you get some forces um, that act uh, which have to be in contact and some which don't have to be in contact. So all forces are a push or a pull. Um, so all forces will either move things away from you or towards you. Um, now these are the list of the contact forces. So contact is where anything is touching. So friction. Air resistance, that's the air touching, going past an object, tension in ropes, reaction from a surface, say a, a table pushing up on a glass of water, for example. And here are the non-contact forces. So we've got magnetic force, gravitational force, and electrostatic force. Those all work over a distance. They don't have to be touching those objects to, uh, to feel the forces. So two magnets, or uh, a moon orbiting a planet, or even two, uh, two ionic um, uh, ions. Uh, feeling an electrostatic force between them in an ionic compound, for example. So, forces then. Um, let's have a look at this example here. This ta this uh, box that is on top of the table here is going to feel a reaction force of the table. You've got a downward weight of the metal block pulling it down, and that reaction force of the table upwards. Now, if, if you've got two forces which are the same size acting on an object, well, then those forces are going to be balanced, and the object will either stay still, or, or carry on moving in the way it's already moving. Okay, so that's um, uh, that's under balance forces. Uh, now here's an example of something under balance forces. This car could either be moving or stationary. Um, well we can't tell just from the picture there. So balance forces means constant speed or stationary. A forward and backward force are the same size. But of course forces aren't always balanced. Um, so we can see here that uh, there is a larger force uh, forwards than there is backwards. So overall, the truck is going to be accelerating in that direction because there is an unbalanced force forward. Um, another way of us thinking about this is to say that there is a, 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 a resultant force uh, forwards. So let's have a look at this example here. So unbalanced forces means they're accelerating or decelerating. Now when we have a look at these examples over here, uh, we've got our two forces acting on this trolley here, 30 and 60 newtons. Well, our resultant force, the overall force being felt by it, is 90 newtons to the right. And uh, this vehicle here has got a, a you know, backward force of 10 newtons, a forward force of 30. So our resultant force is going to be 20 to the right. Okay, so resultant force really does just mean overall force felt by an object. Okay, so let's have a look at a couple of uh, equations then that we need to know about for forces. So if we see a man pushing a truck there, a truck with a mass of 2,000 kilos, it's accelerating by 0.05 um, metres per second per second there, or metres per second squared. Uh, that's its acceleration. Well, to find the force applied, this is one of the classic equations that you need to learn and, and know off by heart for your exams. F equals m times a. So the force of the man pushing there or the woman pushing is going to be that mass times by that acceleration. And you need to know that the units for that are newtons, so 100 newtons. Okay, so that's F equals ma. Be expected to have to rearrange that, popping uh, m down and a down in the bottom of your equation triangle. Pop in and you divide by signs in your F. And of course, cover up the thing you're looking for. So in this case, we're looking for the F. We want to do M times A. If we're looking for the M. We're going to do F divided by A. Okay, and I'd recommend that you learn the equations and then use a uh, triangle just to rearrange it there. Okay, so now using uh, another equation to find involving acceleration. Well, acceleration means the change in the speed each second, change in speed per second. So we can use this equation here, which says acceleration equals your final speed, take away your starting speed, all over the time taken. So it's the change in speed, if you like, over the time taken. Change in, in speed per second tells us the acceleration. So in this example here, we've got this car goes from uh, naught seconds at naught meters per second all the way up to uh, after four seconds, it's now going 16 meters per second. Well, we do the change in speed over the time taken, and that gives us our four meters per 
uh, per second squared, sorry, four meters per second squared. Okay, so speed and velocity are two slightly different things, and they're, they're grouped into um, uh, categories called scalar or vector quantities. Now, scalar quantities, think of the word scale there when you see scalar, has, has no direction, it only has size. So an example of those could be speed, temperature, volume, time, mass, or distance. They only have size, those things have got no direction. And vector quantities are uh, things which have both size and direction. So you would quite often have to show those with an arrow because they will have uh, both size and direction. Of course, the longer the arrow, the bigger the force, and the smaller arrow, the smaller the force. Okay, so displacement, that is, uh, is, is uh, the equivalent of, of distance. Displacement and distance are almost the same thing, except displacement has a direction from the start as well. Okay, so vector quantities have both size and direction. Okay, so having a look at distance uh, time graphs and then on the next slide to velocity time graphs, two ways of us graphing movement. Um, well, if we have a quick look at this problem here, uh, a toy uh, Rudolph the red-nosed reindeer, he moves two meters in three seconds, then he stops for one second, and then he moves another three meters in two seconds. So how we plot that on here, you see we've got distance up the side, we've got time along the bottom. So if he moves two meters in three seconds, there's our first line over there, then he stops for a second, so we're gonna have a vertical line, oh, sorry, a horizontal line, and then he moves another three meters uh, he moves three meters in two seconds now, so we've got our our lines just up there. Okay, well, what can we tell from this? Well, the steeper the uh, gradient, the f higher the speed. So when we have a look at the gradient telling us the speed, well, the steeper the faster. So this is the steepest line, so that is going to be the fastest. Okay, and the uh, flat horizontal section here tells us that that is stopped or stationary. Now, a way of working that out is at three seconds, how far away from the start is he? Two meters. After four seconds, how far away is he from the start? Still at two meters, he is stopped there. Okay, and that means that this section here is a slower speed, um, not as fast as, the, as this top speed up here. So there's our distance time graph. Okay, so here's a velocity time graph, and slightly different things then for this, uh, for this type of graph. So let's have a look at plotting our uh, info on there again. So he goes from a standstill to three meters per second in three seconds. So that's gonna be uh, up to here. He stayed at that speed for two seconds. So his velocity is constant, stays at three, and then he rapidly came to stop in one second. Okay, so really important that we notice the um, the labels on our graph here because they are telling us what type of graph it is and that tells us what the line means. So the gradient tells us the acceleration. So the steeper the gradient, the higher the acceleration or deceleration. Now this here is the steepest line, meaning he's going to be decelerating here really quickly. There's going to be a high deceleration. And this acceleration here is not as steep, uh, so the value for the acceleration will not be as a big a number for the acceleration here as it would be for the deceleration over here. And the flat line means a constant speed. Absolutely do not get this mixed up with distance time graphs, which have also got a flat section, but flat section on the distance time graphs means stopped. Flat section on a velocity time graph means constant speed. They are very different things. Now, another thing you might uh, come across is that the area under the graph tells us the distance traveled. Now, if I just pop back those, um, those lines there, and I'll show you what I mean. So we've got three to three down here and down here again. So what I mean by the uh, area under the graph, we're talking about the bit between the line and the axis. So we can break this up into three shapes. Okay, a triangle there is going to be half times base times height. Okay, to work out the area. So a half times base times height to work out the area of a triangle. So it's going to be 1.5 times 3. Uh, here we've got a rectangle to work out the area for, so that's just going to be um, uh, base times height. And over here again, we've got half base times height working out the area. Okay, so that's how to work, work out the distance travelled by the object. Okay, so let's get rid of that. Okay, so falling objects then. We've got the, need to know the difference between weight, mass and gravity. 
So mass is how much stuff you're made of. Uh, mass is measured in kilos, and your mass is the same no matter where in the universe you are. So Jeff has got a mass of 80 kilos on Earth, and he still has a mass of 80 kilos floating in deepest, darkest space, okay, even when there's no gravity. He still weighs, sorry, he still has the same mass no matter where he is. Okay, so weight is how hard your mass, mass pushes on the ground. Weight is measured in newtons and depends on the strength of gravity. So Jeff still has a mass of 80 kilos, but his weight on the ground is 800 newtons. Now, of course, we all know that's different to how we speak about it in everyday language. We, we talk about weight and, and we give the answer in kilos, but weight in science is a force on the ground. It's how heavy you're pushing on the ground. Okay, so since your weight depends on the mass and the strength of gravity, the equation is uh, weight equals mass times gravity. Okay, so mass is measured in kg, uh, gravity is measured in newtons per kg. Now you will get given the value of gravity, you don't need to learn it, but roughly it's about 10, okay, 10 newtons per kg. Uh, and so to work out the weight, you need to do the mass times by the strength of gravity to work that out. And again, that's going to have to be an equation you, you learn. Okay, so terminal velocity and reaching top speeds. How do things reach a top speed then? And what is terminal velocity? Well, terminal velocity is the maximum falling speed an object can reach. Okay, now it's a, it's a constant speed, uh, so that means the forces on it are balanced. And so here's an example of someone falling out of a, uh, an aeroplane, a skydiver. Their air resistance force is the same size as their gravity, as, the, as, a, as their weight. Okay, so the upward force is the same as the downward force, so they are constant speed because the forces are balanced. Now, terminal velocity depends on the, both the shape of the uh, and the area of, of the person involved, because that will decide what the air resistance is. Okay, but why must a person falling from the sky or a car have a top speed or a van or a bus? Why must they have top speeds? And we can just replace these red words with other similar words in the for the context you've been given in the exam. So why does why does everything ever have to have a top speed? Well, as the object gets faster, the drag or air resistance increases. Okay, the faster you're going forwards, the uh, the bigger the air resistance acting against you. Now, um, as the car gets faster, the drag increases until it's as big as the forward force from the engine, or as big as the weight for the man falling down. Uh, when they balance, the car no longer accelerates. So when they're under balanced forces, it's no longer getting faster. Okay, so we can say that to start off with, we're going to have a bigger uh, forward force on a car. And the faster it gets, that forward force is still going to be the same size, uh, but that backward force will get just a little bit longer as the car's speeding up or the man is increasing in speed. Until they're balanced, then we've got a resultant force of zero. Resultant force of zero means it's not accelerating or changing speed. Okay, and here is our lovely car there, just to show that off. Okay, Hooke's Law, springs and elastics. So anything that stretches, as long as it doesn't overstretch, obeys a, an important law. Okay, so let's have a look at when something stretches. We need to know the term extension. So here is a stretch Armstrong. There's the original length of his arm. Here's the final length of his stretched arm. Well, to work out his extension, we need to do the final length versus uh, the final length take away the start length. So it's showing us the difference between the original length and the final length. Okay, so Hooke's law says that if I pull on a spring twice as hard, then the spring will extend twice as much. Okay, so pull twice as hard on his arm, his arm gets twice as his his arm extends by twice as much. Doesn't necessarily mean it gets twice as long. I just said it's extending twice as much. Now, in technical terms, that means the extension of a spring is directly proportional to the force applied. Okay, as long as the spring has not passed its elastic limit. So a quick sketch of a graph there should show directly proportional means two things, it goes through zero, zero, and it's a straight line. Okay, so as long as it hasn't passed its elastic limit, and in fact we're just going to have a quick look at an example of that over the page in just a moment. So here's our equation for Hooke's law, this relates to springs, and force equals the spring constant, in other words that's like the stretchiness of the spring, how springy it is, times by the extension. Okay, so that's a, that K there is a property of the spring itself. You know, you get weak and stretchy springs and you get really strong and firm springs. That K there is, is uh, that springiness, if you like, the spring constant, that's called. Okay, so here's an example then of uh, a classic question they ask with this. Um, so a student investigates how the extension of a spring depends on the force applied to the spring. The diagram shows the spring before and after a force has been, been applied. 
So let's have a quick line there. So at the bottom of the spring is B, and the bottom of the spring is still B there. Now complete the following sentence using the letters A, B, C, or D from the diagram. The extension of the spring is the distance between the positions labelled what and what on the metre rule. Well, it's going to be between B there and where the new uh, extended length is there at the bottom of the spring is going to be B to C. Okay, and it's quite a classic question that they'll ask you to be able to show the extension of it. Another thing I wanted to show us with Hooke's Law is they'll often show us a, uh, a picture here of, of the spring extension. Now, don't forget what I said, that the graph is directly proportional um, before the spring has been overstretched. So it's going to be directly proportional for this section. Okay, now there's a mistake that they've made here. They've included the original length of the spring. So the, the original length of the spring there is 50 mil. They should have started this line from zero, so it should be following roughly that sort of shape. Now it says here, mark on the graph the limit of proportionality of the spring. In other words, where does it stop being straight and start being curved? Okay, so you'd want to mark on there somewhere around that point in there. You'd want to put a P just to show that that is where it's gone past its limit of proportionality. It's overstretched, if you like. Okay, crash mats and car safety, momentum. So momentum depends on two things, mass and velocity. Now you can have two objects going the same speed, one has definitely got a lot more uh, momentum in it. So the bus would be much harder to stop because it's got a much higher mass, the cyclist much easier to stop because it's got a lower mass, even though they can both be going the same speed. Now having a look at some of these units, this is an equation we need to learn here. So mass, we should all know, is measured in kg, velocity is measured in m slash s, well, how can we know if we know those two units? How can we remember that one? Well, because those are the units in the equation. So kg times by m slash s uh, will just give us the unit for, for p. So I've just multiplied the units up here. So we would have kg m slash s. We just put, put them together and get rid of the, the times in the middle. Okay, so you can work out those units in an exam if, uh, if necessary. Okay, now momentum works uh, not only just for one object movement moving, we can calculate the momentum, but also we can apply it to situations. So there's a, a law that says the conservation of momentum. The law of conservation of momentum is about conserving or keeping and maintaining the same amount of momentum. So the total momentum of two objects before an event, and by an event I mean an explosion or a collision, um, before an event is the same as the total momentum of the two objects after an event. So, for example, if we look at a cannon inside this, um, this cannon is a cannonball. Neither of them are moving. Both have a velocity of zero. So the momentum of the, uh, of the ball uh, equals zero. The momentum of the cannon equals zero. The total momentum is still zero. Now, if they told you in an exam question that the momentum of the uh, uh, ball here was, I don't know, 100 um, units, um, what would be the momentum of the cannon backwards? Well, the cannon would have the same momentum in the opposite direction, so the uh, cannon there would be uh, minus 100 um, kg m slash s, just meaning that the forward and back mom backward momentum of those two things would be the same because the total momentum before the event was zero. And the same here for these two cars. So let's just say uh, for a second that these two cars crashed into each other and stopped dead. Well, then the total momentum would be zero. You know, if they've got no speed, they've got no momentum. Uh, so then you would know that whatever the momentum of the white car was would be the same as the momentum of the, of the grey car, even if they had different masses. So you might see that m times v for the white car would have to equal m times v for the grey car. Which could be really useful in doing some final calculations there. If they told you the masses of them both, both and they told you the speed of one of them, you could work out the speed of the other, for example. OK, so stopping distances then. This is about making things, uh, making vehicles stop. Um, so the total stopping distance, the time it takes from you seeing a deer jump out of you on a new forest road to your car coming to a complete standstill that's made up of two distances that is it's made up of uh, the thinking distance um, and the braking distance now the thinking distance 
the thinking distance, uh, sorry, both stop, the, the entire stopping distance increases with speed. So both your thinking distance and your braking distance um, increase with speed. The faster you're going, no matter how fast your reactions, your thinking distance will increase, the distance you travel while thinking about putting your foot on the brake or reacting to that. Um, now, braking distance uh, is affected by anything that affects friction between your car and the road or the brakes of your car. So type of road surface, um, gravelly or hard tarmac, poor weather, so rain, ice, snow, poor condition of the vehicle brakes or tyres, so worn out brakes uh, will reduce friction so that the uh, car will take longer to stop. Thinking distance is anything that affects your ability to have fast reactions. So your, how tired you are, the drugs, uh, alcohol and distractions which might be uh, affecting you there. Okay, so that's really it for a, a quick whistle-stop tour of uh, forces then. Um, so now let's have a look at waves. So let's have a look at our two different types of waves. So we've got transverse waves and longitudinal waves. Um, now I'm sure all of you have seen these on a slinky, so I've included these pictures here just for, uh, for a graphic. So transverse waves are where the vibrations are at 90 degrees to the direction of energy transfer. So let's have a look here. Transverse wave is moving his hand side to side. As his hand moves side to side, the slinky shakes from side to side, but direction of energy is going forwards, okay, away from the person who's shaking their hands. Okay, and longitudinal waves are uh, with the different type of vibrations. They have vibrations which are parallel to the, um, the direction of energy transfer. So this person is moving their hand in the direction of the, uh, of the wave and the direction of the energy is still going away from the person as they move their hands backwards and forwards. And you can see here that, the, that what you see move down the spring are areas where the spring are squidged up and areas where the spring is spread out. Okay, And we give those scientific uh, names. We can say that this is an area of expansion, so the, uh, they are far apart, and this is an area where they are compressed, so compression, okay, and expansion or, or rarefaction, uh, we sometimes call that. Now, you need to know examples for both of these. Light and electromagnetic waves both travel as transverse waves. Sound travels as a longitudinal wave. So our air particles in between our ears and our, um, and our vocal cords are doing this um, sort of effect here where you get areas where they're spread out and areas where they're closer together. Okay, so which could be shown on a, on a slinky as well. Okay, so having a look at these, uh, these diagrams uh, in a bit more detail then. So we've got a wavelength of this transverse wave. One wavelength goes from one peak to the next peak. And here's, here's our peak there. Down at the bottom we've got a trough because of that shape view. We've got our peak up here. Now wavelengths may not only be from peak to peak or trough to trough. Okay, They could also be from a zero point to the next zero point after a full wave. So a full wave includes an up and a down part. Okay, so with these waves here, in fact with both types of waves, frequency is a really important idea. Frequency refers to how many waves go past per second. Okay, so time period then, what's time period? Time period is how long one wave takes to pass. Okay, now these two things are clearly related. If, you, if a wave goes by in a short amount of time, you're going to have a high frequency. And they're related using this equation here, T, the time period, equals 1 over the frequency. Okay, so the bigger, the, the higher the frequency, the bigger the number for the frequency, the smaller the time period, the shorter the length of time of wave. Okay, and here are the units for what they're measured in. Now in our longitudinal waves, so our examples were sound for that one, we've got an area of rare refraction where they're spread out. We've got an area of compression here where they're squidged up. Okay, now one wavelength then, one wavelength is going to be from the back of the compression to the front of the compression, or it could equally be from the middle of the compression to the middle of the compression, or from the end of the compression to the end of the compression. It has to be one full wave, and a full wave, because it has to include both a peak and a trough, has to include uh, one um, uh, compression and the rare refraction as well. So that there would be a badly drawn wave, or maybe that's a bit better there. Okay, now this very important wave equation here, V equals F times lambda. If ever there's an equation in physics that you need to know, it's this one. K 
comes up in every exam paper I've ever seen. So V equals F times lambda. So what do the V, the F and the lambda stand for? V is wave velocity, the speed of the wave. Uh, F is the frequency of the wave we've come across just over here. And wavelength is the length of uh, from one uh, compression to the next compression or from a zero point to a zero point, that wavelength there. So the wavelength, the length of the wave is related um, uh, you times that by the frequency to find how quickly the wave's going past. This has to be one of the most important equations in physics. There are five examples of practicals that you need to know about for measuring wave speed. Three of them all use the wave equation, which is V equals F lambda, as you can see down here. And the two on the next slide use the speed equals distance over time equation to work them out. Now you would have seen all of these in class, but it's just a quick whistle-stop tour of how to, um, of just briefly, how these work. So this is an example where we've got a signal generator, a speaker, and two microphones. And we've got an oscilloscope that shows the shape of the wave on the oscilloscope. Now you start off with both microphones starting together at the same distance. So you would have the other one just above it as well. So they're the same distance from the speaker, that same distance there. Then you would gradually move this second, you'd move the second microphone away until the wave that appeared on the oscilloscope had moved one full wavelength along. And when it's moved one full wavelength along, the distance between the two microphones tells you, therefore, that is one wavelength lambda. The frequency you would read from the signal generator, along with all of these, um, they've all got signal generators on. Then you would use that equation. So if you get an exam question that asks you to explain any of these methods, you have to give the equation to say what you know what you would do with the values you take from the practical. Okay, so this is now a wave on a uh, on a string, and this would work similarly for a wave on a spring as well. If the spring was uh, hanging vertically, you would also see the same thing if there was a spring with a vibration generator at the top there. Okay, so measure the distance. You're going to set up the wave on here using the vibrator. That's going to give you a uh, the generator is going to give you a uh, frequency. Uh, then you're going to set up a wave on here and you're going to measure one, at least one wavelength. Notice it's got a, a peak and a trough in it. You're going to measure one wavelength and that'll tell you the wavelength and the generator will tell you the frequency. And you could again use V equals F times lambda. Now you may want to take a few waves and divide by those that number of waves um, to make your answer more accurate. If you only measure one wave, your answer isn't going to be as accurate as if you measure five and divide by five. Okay, ripple tank method then. So a uh, ripple tank is something you should have all seen. So you're going to set up a paddle on the top and there would be a vibration generator again. So the, the power supply and the oscillating paddle um, should have a value on it to tell you the frequency of the wave, how many times it's vibrating. Measure the distance for a wavelength. And again, uh, any two of the black lines would do, but probably measure 10, divide by 10, that'd make it more accurate. Okay, so all of these ones need for you to use that V equals F times lambda equation. And if in doubt, just, just write that out. Okay, so for these practicals, uh, you need to use the speed distance time equation. And this is what the speed distance time equation looks for your GCSEs. Velocity, speed, equals displacement, which is an S, divided by T. So it's velocity, speed, equals distance, di displacement, divided by time. Okay, so V equals S over T. Not to be confused with in year 7 when we would have used speed as S and uh, we would have used D for distance. Not to be It's the same equation but with different, different symbols now. So here we've got a laptop hooked up to uh, two microphones. The two microphones simply just record when the noise goes past. So the laptop is hooked up designed to tell us when the noise goes past the first one and then the time to get it past the, the second one. So the microphones record the time for the waves to pass. You need to measure the distance between the microphones. Okay, that'll tell you the distance. And then on the computer, that'll tell you the time on the computer. You can use speed equals distance over time. Okay, the next one is about the echo method. So here we've got a guy firing a cannonball. Now that noise is going to go off to the wall. It's going to bounce back from the wall and it's going to come back to him. So uh, use a stopwatch to record the time for the sound to travel to the wall and back. You need to measure the distance to the wall and back. Don't forget about that bit. Uh, then use speed equals distance over time. Be prepared in the exams. I've seen people, uh, I've seen examiners ask, um, you know, they've deliberately not 
times the distance by two or they've deliberately only given the time for the for the sound to reach there so keep an eye over that that's got to go there and back again okay so refraction of waves then so all waves can be absorbed transmitted or reflected uh, now absorbed just means for example as an example microwaves cooking foods so microwaves go into the food and increase the temperature transmitted could be light going through glass and that can lead to refraction that we're going to look at in just a moment and reflected for example with the echo of a sound or using a mirror for light so this is a classic uh, diagram of a ray of light going into a, a perspex or glass block so we can see here the angle of incidence here we've got the angle of refraction and notice why have we drawn a dotted line and what is this dotted line called okay the dotted line is called the normal and the only reason we draw a normal, not because we want to, not because it's fun, is to be able to draw these, um, these uh, angles here. And here is our angle of incidence. Here's our angle of refraction. Okay, and we can see the light uh, bends at the boundary. So it's only at a boundary that light bends. Uh, it changes direction there because it changes speed when it goes into the more dense material. So the more dense, the slower the speed. Okay, light will slow down in glass and will speed up when it moves from glass into air or glass into water. Okay, so we need to be able to show uh, using wave fronts. Now these lines here could easily just represent um, a peak of these waves going into a glass block. Now these are the peaks of the wave going in. Now as the wave enters the glass block, it slows down, but because of the equation V equals F times lambda, the waves will uh, reduce in, in, in wavelength. Um, in order for the for them to slow down, so the, so the wavelengths will uh, decrease, meaning the waves get closer together. Okay, so the wavelength is reduced, and the frequency will stay the same. And then, as they come out, they will speed up again, so the wave fronts will get further apart. Okay, now that's fine for any for a uh, ray of light entering a block at 90 degrees, it will go straight through. But where the wave fronts uh, come at an angle, so here's our dotted normal here. When they come at an angle, well, one side of the ray is going to hit the block first. And as it hits the block, it slows down, causing that wave to turn. Okay, so that these we can see it turning here because of the wave fronts hitting the um, hitting the glass block at an angle. Okay, so electromagnetic waves then. Now we all know a really good mnemonic for for learning the order of these. Now I won't repeat um, on air because it'll be recorded. But we all know um, the using the first letters. Now this one's in reverse, but normally we start from this end, and uh, they use something in somewhere. Um, so we've got. We've got our rays along here. So radio waves, we've got really long waves, as we can see here. Microwaves, slightly shorter. Infrared, even shorter. Moving through visible light, ultraviolet light, X-rays and gamma rays to the to the highest, uh, the shortest wavelength or the highest frequencies. Now, I just want to show people um, just a little bit about these numbers. So wavelength then. So this is a number referring to a wavelength of around about 1,000 meters. So these are radio waves. We've got a wavelength of around a, a kilometer or so. And as we move up through this scale here, we can see that, the, that the, the wavelength gets shorter. So this is having a shorter wavelength here, all the way up to, for example, let's take ultraviolet rays. So that means we're moving the number uh, nine times. So we're going to have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And that should be the number there. Let me just double check that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's it. Okay, so we've moved that decimal place or moved that number nine times. That there is the wavelength of a ultraviolet ray. Okay, frequency. Now, the reason I know to make the number smaller here is because that's a negative number there, 10 to the minus 9. Now, when we look at the frequencies over here, 10 to the 10 means that I'm going to have 10 numbers after, 10 zeros after the decimal place. So, 1, 2, 3, 4. So that is my frequency in hertz. That's how many uh, times per second uh, this wave is vibrating backwards and forwards. So you need to be familiar with those standard form uh, numbers there with the wavelength and the frequencies. Okay, so I'm going to go through now a few uses and dangers of each of the electromagnetic waves. Now radio waves are produced because in one in the antenna they will have a, uh, a uh, current, an alternating current in here. And that alternating current, if you think about what current is, it's the flow of moving charges. So those cur that current, because it's alternating, those moving charges are oscillating, vibrating backwards and forwards, up and down this, uh, this uh, antenna. 
and that will generate a wave. Okay, so a wave will be put out from this antenna, and that wave will interact with the electrons over here in this receiver, and they will make those ones go backwards and forwards. Okay, so that the uh, the frequency of your AC current here will be uh, will induce a uh, AC current over here, and that's picked up by your radio receiver. Okay, so uh, radio waves. Now, radio waves can be used to, for long distance communications, of course, and you can see here that a radio wave will be reflected from a charged layer on the uh, upper atmosphere. So it will be sent up upwards, and it will get bent or refracted back down to back down to Earth. Okay, so even though they're not in a line of sight. You can see round the corner of the Earth, around the curved surface of the Earth through radio waves because they don't pass out through the atmosphere. Now microwaves, however, they're used to communicate with satellites. And the reason why they can be used to communicate with satellites is because they're, um, those rays will travel in a straight line straight through the atmosphere. Now, of course, we're probably more familiar with these types of microwaves. Now, we use different, slightly different wavelengths for cooking than we would do for communicating with um, satellites. Only, it's only slightly different. The microwave energy is absorbed by water molecules in the food to heat it up. So it warms up the water molecules, and those vibrate and pass on their energy to the other molecules in the food. OK, now, uh, infrared and thermal energy, these are uh, used for a, a number of things. So monitoring temperature, for example, on a house, you can take a, a thermal image of your house and you can see which parts are hotter. So the redder the hotter, it looks like they've got their chimney on because you can see a nice stripe there up there where their, their chimney appears a little bit warmer. Um, it's also used for yeah, infrared cameras on thermal imaging sites, heating food. So a, um, a bright red light would heat up food in a restaurant or even your grill would heat using, uh, or your toaster would heat using infrared. Remote controls and electric heaters. So there is a, an, a practical we need to be able to use for uh, or describe to show how infrared energy is, uh, is given out depending on the colour of the surface. So this is a picture of uh, Leslie's cube that you would have seen. And what we've got here in the hand is an infrared thermometer. And this person is, is pointing it at the different surfaces. You've got black and white and shiny silver. And they're pointing at the different surfaces and recording the infrared energy given off as a temperature. Um, now, really important that if you describe this practical, you talk about them being the same, the thermometer is the same distance from the, uh, from the box every time. Otherwise, you're not getting a, a fair reading um, because the, the energy spreads out um, the further away you are from it. So you want to be the same distance each time. And then here's quite a nice picture showing the energy on a, uh, from a Leslie cube, which is filled up with boiling water, so it's really hot. And here we've got the black side. We can see it in black and white there. There's the black side. Because it's black, it's giving out a lot more thermal energy than the other sides. Um, because black, matte black, is the best emitter and best uh, absorber of heat radiation. It both takes in and uh, gives out heat radiation really easily. Unlike shiny silver. Shiny silver here is, is, is cooler. You can see here it's in the blue, the blue part of the scale there, around here. It's cooler because shiny silver is a poor emitter. It's also a poor absorber as well. It doesn't absorb energy very well. And in fact, it's such a poor absorber that you can see the energy, which is from the um, slightly warmer hand, and that energy from the warm hand is reflecting off of the Leslie cube. Um, so that shiny silver layer is even reflecting the heat that it can see from the outside. You can see the trace of the hand there. Okay, so a use of visible light. Now, just to mention that there is really no, not much danger in radio waves and microwaves. Um, and infrared, a little bit of burning, you know, you could burn your hand under infrared radiation. Visible light, you know, you could damage your eyes, but nothing, um, nothing too, too, too bad, as we're going to find out with the other ones, they can be a bit worse. So optical fibres um, are a thin piece of glass uh, which can be used to carry data, and light is shone in at one end, and it bounces, it reflects off the inside of the tube there. And it works because it's, it's internally reflected. You can see the light ray come in, if it comes in at a, 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 a big enough angle there compared to the normal, it will stay on the inside. It will be totally internally reflected. Okay, UV light, we know that's used for skin tanning. Um, skin tanning is, uh, it, it can lead to skin issues, so skin cancer or premature aging of the skin. X-rays, they're used for imaging bones. Now, just briefly about how they work. X-rays are absorbed by the bone or anything hard, so you can see the skull is absorbing the X-rays. Um, th this photographic plate was originally all white, it started off as all white, and it goes black where the x-rays hit it. So the x-rays are going through nice and easily through the flesh here, so they, they will appear darker on the screen than, for example, the keys, which will be absorbing those x-rays, 
the x-rays won't pass through that, so you s they stay white on the screen. Now, ionizing the, the, the harm that can be caused by x-rays is that ionizing radiation can knock electrons from atoms, leading to DNA mutations and cancer. So x-rays, should you should be limited to the amount of x-rays you have. You can have a few thousand of them in your lifetime, but you, they are dangerous. Uh, ionizing radiation can knock electrons from atoms, leading to DNA mutations and cancer. Okay, now gamma rays. We may remember gamma rays from our um, year 10 physics that we did on alpha, beta and gamma radiation. Gamma radiation is emitted from nuclei of unstable uh, particles. So gamma rays can be used to sterilize medical equipment because they kill all cells and they can also be used to treat cancerous cells that's again because they kill all cells and um, but they're carefully fired from lots of angles to minimize the damage to healthy cells so here we've got our gamma rays coming in from all different angles okay and as they come in they're being moved around at different positions so that the, the place where they're being concentrated is on the cancerous cells and then we can see these normal cells here the harm is being spread out it's being minimized Okay, now radiation dose is measured in sieverts, and it's a measure of um, not just the, the, the amount of radiation, but it takes into account the type of radiation as well. So it's really a measure of the harm caused, as opposed to like the amount of radiation, which the amount of radiation on its own would be measured in be becquerels. Okay, so that's two of our three topics uh, down then, and let's have a quick look at uh, the magnetism uh, topic. So in magnetism, we've got our permanent and induced magnets, uh, electromagnetism, and just for higher tier only, we've got the motor effect in there as well. So, uh, permanent and induced magnets. Well, these field lines coming out the side here, they show the force of attraction. And it's the force of attraction felt by another north pole. So if I was to bring a, a north over here, okay, that north pole would be attracted to the south because that's the direction of the arrow. If I brought a north pole over here, it would feel a force away because that's the direction of the arrow. Now the closer the lines, the stronger the force. So we've got a really strong force here, really strong force there, because that's where the lines are close together. Okay, so it's, the force is stronger near the poles. And from playing with magnets when you were um, toddlers, you'd have noticed those that, that the, um, the, the force is strongest when they're really close together. Okay, so something to remember is that the field lines go always go from north to south, and it's important that we know how to draw them. So look really quickly, I'm just going to draw this magnet. They come out of the north end. They loop around and they go back into the south end. Okay, so we should always draw an arrow at either place. Okay, so we're drawing one row at a time. Comes out of the north again and goes into the south again. Now that can be repeated. Okay, and they can come off. You don't have to continue the lines forever. They don't all have to loop around, but you need to show enough arrows there to show the examiner that you know that they all go into the south come out the north. Okay, the earth acts like a giant bar magnet um, because of the uh, liquid um, iron core that it has and it acts just the same as a magnet. We've got um, uh, field lines uh, showing the force of attraction around the outside of the planet and that of course is how compasses work. There's a, a weak field around us, also how pigeons find their way home as well. Fact of the day. Okay, so when we when we bring two uh, magnets together, we have to be really specific about the language we use about how uh, two north poles act or two uh, opposite poles. We have to use the word attract and repel. It's no good saying they will get brought together or um, you know bring, come closer together. You can't use language like that. You must say the word attract or repel to get those words. So repellent. You know, think of insect repellent, that, that's, that scares off insects, and that um, the, the saying of opposites attracting, while well, it's probably not true really in humans, um, uh, it is a phrase that can help you remember how magnets work. Now if you see the rays, of the um, sorry, the field lines being pushed apart, it's because they're being repelled, and if you see the field lines going straight from one into the other, that's the force of attraction. Okay, so we need to be able to show field lines around a bar magnet. There are two different ways of doing this. We can show the field lines um, by scattering iron filings over a piece of paper, okay, with the compass underneath. So the compass, uh, the magnet probably would have been that shape underneath a piece of paper. They've sprinkled these little dots all over it and they will then line up showing the field lines. Another way of doing it is to place, and I'm sure you probably won't have this many of compasses in the exam, you'll have one compass, and so you just place the compass at different places around the, uh, the magnet, marking on where the north is. So you can see there I'm just putting on a little, a little line there to show where the north is, and 
okay, and then you could mark that off, and that would then show you the direction of the field. Now, roughly speaking, if I get a okay, we've got the field roughly like that. Okay, this is a little bit closer there. Okay, so the field lines will be roughly like that, not to forget to put your arrows on them, showing them go north to south. Okay, so whenever we have a current uh, in a piece of wire, uh, and that current is moving, uh, that current generates a magnetic field. So there will be a magnetic field around every wire which is carrying current. Now, because there's a magnetic field, that means that there are field lines. And the field lines are circular field lines. Uh, they're circular around it. Of course, the closer together, the stronger the field. So really close to the wire, the, wires, the, the lines will be closer together because that's where there will be a stronger force. Further away, the, the lines will be further away. Now, notice that the field line direction switches depending on whether the current is going up or whether the current is going down. The direction of the, uh, of the field lines there changes. So we've got a nice handy method to be able to remember this. Okay, it's called the right hand grip rule and if in the exam you're shown a, a piece of wire with a current flowing through it, the current is your thumb. So you point your thumb in the direction of the current. Your fingers that curl round the wire your wire is going through the centre of your hand there, your fingers which curl round show you the direction of the magnetic field lines. Okay, so fingers are field lines and your thumb here is the current. Okay, and that can be flipped round if the current is now moving downwards. You can flip that round and you can see your fingers now pointing the other way, showing us the field lines being the other way. Okay, electromagnets. We can make um, we can make magnets. Um, how we make magnets is by wrapping a coil of wire around a, uh, a piece of iron. We wrap the coil of a wire around and we connect it to a source of potential difference, um, letting a current flow through it. Okay, now we can increase the strength, of the, it's known as a solenoid, an electromagnet. We can increase the strength of it by doing a few different things. We can either uh, increase the current, so, you know, more powerful battery, turning the current up on a power pack increasing the number of turns on the coil, having more loops, okay, loop them tighter, uh, make the make it longer, having more turns on it, or adding a soft iron core. Now this one has already got one, but soft iron core is literally just a, a bar of iron through the middle, and that also helps to increase the strength of the electromagnet. Now an electromagnet has very similar field lines to a permanent magnet, in fact you could say the same. There is our bar magnet, there is our solenoid, our electromagnet. You can see the lines come out of the end and go into the end. Now notice, try not to draw them coming out of the side because really that will just make it more, more confusing for the examiner. So they're coming out of, what, of the north and going into the south there. And possible questions relating to electromagnets is why are they, why are they useful? Why use an electromagnet instead of a permanent magnet? Well, the biggest reason is because you can turn them on and off. If you can turn them on and off, you can pick things up and drop them down where you need them to be, for example, in a car scrapyard. You can also increase the strength of a magnet by putting in more or less current. Okay, You can't do that with a permanent magnet, but you can increase the strength of an electromagnet um, either by using more current or adding more coils as well. Okay, now this part of the uh, presentation is for higher tier only. If you are a foundation tier, uh, that's covered all of the content for you. So thank you very much for listening. Um, now just for, for a few minutes of, of higher tier work then, for the remaining few people that would be doing separate science, higher tier, or combined science, um, higher tier. Let's just go through quickly the motor effect then. So if a current, uh, if a wire that has current makes its own electro, uh, uh, magnetic field around it, as we just saw in the previous couple of slides. Well, if we now place this current carrying wire and place it in a magnetic field between uh, a magnet, in a magnet there, it's going to experience a force. Now, this is because the magnetic field around the wire, which we saw in the, um, in the last slide, so we could have a magnetic field around a wire like so, that magnetic field will interact with um, the magnetic field from the magnet. So we've got these field lines interacting with these circular field lines around the wire. Okay, they interact, two magnets interact, they create a force. So uh, we can work out the direction of this force. We can work it out by using Fleming's left hand rule. Now a few things we need to know before we make 
before we learn the, the Fleming's left hand rule, we need to know like how to show on the diagram which way current goes and which way the magnetic field lines go. So a few facts before we look at the, uh, uh, the rule. Um, field lines always go north to south. So in this case, they're already drawn on here for us, but north to south field lines. Current always goes plus to minus. Now, in this case, again, it's shown there for us already. It's got the direction of current there, but um, current will always go plus to minus, and sometimes they'll just show you the plus and minus and get you to uh, get you to work out the direction of the current from that. So once you know the direction of the field lines and the direction of the current, now you can use your hand in this shape here. So each thing is at each finger or thumb is at 90 degrees to the rest. You've got your thumb pointed up, first finger pointed forwards, um, uh, second finger pointed uh, to the side there. And it has to be your left hand as well, because your right hand, of course, is a mirror image. It will provide you with the wrong answers. So your left hand will. Now your thumb here will show you the direction that the force on the wire will feel, um, uh, the direction of the, the, the wire will move in. So normally they'd be asking you to work out the force. So you would need to make sure that your first finger is pointed in the direction of the field lines. So here, the example is in the direction of the field lines. You want to point your first finger that way, to the right of the uh, of the screen. Then your second finger here is going to be uh, pointed into the screen. So you want your second finger to be pointed away from you into the screen like so. Now, if you've got your hands in the correct position, because your first finger is that way and your second finger is that way, you should hopefully find that your thumb now is pointing downwards. Okay, so on this on this example here, the direction of the force will be downwards. There's also an equation to apply for these uh, for these higher tier uh, motor effect questions, and that is um, force felt by the wire is calculated by B, the magnetic flux density. Don't worry about that, it just means the strength of the field. So the strength of the field times the current times the length of the wire. Okay, the longer the wire in, in the field, the stronger the force. The bigger the current, the stronger the force. The stronger the magnet, the stronger the force. Okay, and these are the units for them. Tesla, you may need to know about that for B, magnetic flux density is measured in Tesla. You may have heard of that before. Okay, so now applying this uh, motor effect, um, uh, Fleming's left hand rule to a motor to be able to work out the direction that the motor spins. So first off, just a little bit of science about this uh, this motor then. So we've got a power supply, we've got our plus, and we've got our minus there. Um, so the current always goes plus to minus. So we've got our current comes down this side. The split ring commutator here, like it says here, it just lets the contact switch every half a turn to keep the motor spinning, to keep the coil spinning. If you didn't have a split ring commutator there, it would just get raveled up in a big in a big knot and, and wouldn't keep spinning. So here we've got the current moving away from the plus towards the minus, and here we've got it now coming towards the, the minus there. The current is just going around in a loop. Okay, so uh, then we've got our north pole here and a south pole here. So we know already field lines always go north to south. So the field um, um, will be going left to right. And then the current is both going away and towards us. So how we how we work this out is we have to just pick a side. Okay, so let's just pick that side, and we're going to apply Fleming's left hand rule to that part of the wire, because what we what we'll find, of course, is that this part of the wire goes the other way. And that's how it ends up spinning. So let's have a quick look at this then. So to use Fleming's left hand rule, pick one side of the rotating coil. Let's pick this side. Current always flows plus to minus. So current is coming this way. So this is where we want to use our second finger to point it towards us. So your middle finger there is pointed towards your chest. And then um, the field lines, we said the field lines are going to be moving uh, left to right. So your first finger wants to be towards the right of the screen. And in fact, just exactly that same shape, we're going to find that this part of the coil finds an upward force. Okay, so, and then literally just test that now for your for the other side there, and we've got our field line still going uh, left to right, but this time current is going away from you. So your middle finger wants to be pointed into the computer screen, which is quite difficult to do, but then you should find that your thumb now is pointing downwards. Okay, so do just pause that and replay it if you're not sure about what I just did there, just to go back and listen to that again. Okay, so you apply it just to one side of the coil, and you uh, position your 
first finger and your second finger into the right places um, and rotate your hand to find the answer. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening. That is the end of our uh, of our session and uh, look forward to making the next revision video for you before your real exams. Thank you.